Services Company to do. Our next guest, well, he may have some thoughts on that matter. Harvey Gala Brown, American Express from 1993 to 2001. Served on any number of boards of directors. Nice to have you here. Thank you, Peter. All right, so you know, what do we do? These, what do you do if you're uh, if you're running a Bank America these days? You're in the in crosshairs of so many different things at this point, both with your employees and, of course, just dealing with your own balance sheet. Well, if I'm running a financial any financial services firm today, I'm probably going to try and stay as flexible as I can, keep liquidity as high as I can and try and influence the regulations that come out of the, the massive and dysfunctional Dodd-Frank bill. It's going to take another five years before we see what all those regs are. They are not going to be benign. Uh, they will affect negatively financial institutions. So I, I've got to keep the institution flexible to see to see what will happen and then how I can best respond to it. Right. And of course, Dodd-Frank has come up a great deal over the last year. And as you say, it's going to be years of, of rule writing and, and things related to that. Back to the current situation where you have so many uncertainties, both in the U.S. economy right now and where it's headed and in Europe. You know, again, flexibility. Do you, uh, you know, how do you deal with a market like this in which there are rumors and innuendo that can oftentimes uh, create the fear that people are afraid of but wasn't there in the first place? You can't. Uh, it, the, the uncertainty is not, is not the problem, it's the certainty that's the problem. We know that until the next presidential election in this country we're going to pursue policies that, that will be different from the rhetoric. We will say what we want to do is grow GDP and grow jobs and the policies that will be put in place by the administration will do the opposite. We know that. So nothing's going to change for the next, for the next two years. The best that, that can happen for the economy is for the, the House conservatives to stop the more egregious actions uh, from, from continuing. You think the economy is headed into a recession? Uh, I think it might. It, it, it's close. You think this current period has sort of helped push it over the edge if that, if that was the case? It, it's, not, it's not the current period. What's, what's pushing it is... Um, it, it, as you as you you pointed out a number of times, as a consumer-driven economy, we still got the drag of the asset values of houses, which have to come through the the, the individual uh, balance sheets. We've got people who are trying to deleverage, so they're not going to be spending, particularly in an uncertain environment, with, about their jobs. Um, that drag is is going to continue, and. And every day we see actions that discourage businesses from making investments. So for the next such as I mean I mean you've, made, okay. you've hit it a number of times. So give me I, I know give Gary's me, got a lot of questions here, but give okay. me an example. I'll give you I'll give you two examples. We made an announcement, or the administration made an announcement, what two or three days ago, that insurance companies had to provide for free contraceptive um, activities, advice, and whatever for individuals. Free. It can't be free. Um, the effect of that will be people who are buying those, those things on their own will now be doing it through their insurance company and not paying for it. I don't think we'd ever get to contraceptives on the strategy yeah. session, but it, okay. it, that, thanks that, for taking That's going to happen. So we're going to raise the cost in the healthcare system. We're going to spread that to everybody else. It's going to raise costs. The, the NLRB takes action against Boeing uh, for building a, wanting to build a plant in South Carolina. That will that has an effect on Boeing, but has an effect on everybody else who also thinks about moving the plant and building. Right. And building that gets lumped in with the administration a lot, but they of course claim that that's a separate function, that they're sort of benign, so to speak, yeah. in terms of uh, what's going on there. I but, know it gets focused on a but, great but, deal but, that but, situation. But Peter, that's bullshit. David, 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 I'm sorry, David. That, that, I don't know why I said Peter. I know what Peter favored. Yeah, that is bullshit. Yeah. I mean, I'm not supposed to say it in this word, but you know that. Well, we heard a couple of things on the show we haven't heard. Let, let me take back to the financials <laughs> one for a second. Because you successfully managed the business through uncertain times. You grew revenues. You sold off assets. You rationalized the business. So, two questions. Number one, if you're running one of these banks right now, can you focus on, re uh, on growing revenues? That's the first thing. Second thing, are some of these institutions, which are now going to have to sell off assets, um, is that the right strategy, or is this a terrible time to be trying to sell off businesses to try to increase your capital? If you sell off businesses, it, when businesses are doing great, you don't want to sell them because they're doing great you know, and you want the net income. When they're not doing great, you have to sell them at the, at the press prices. What institutions have to think about is what their long-term strategy is. If, if their long-term strategy is to operate smaller, leaner businesses that are more focused, then they should sell the business as a strategic matter 
for whatever the price well, is. So, somebody looking at financial services companies, is that the right way to go right now? I mean, you've, you've seen it all. Should you be in a focused, standalone, one business business? Yes. Okay. Not nice. necessarily one business, but th there has to be a strategic Financial thing. supermarket does not work. Does not work. Yeah, it never you, worked. Yeah. Do you think we'll start to see pressure on some of these corporations that haven't returned to anything in terms of shareholder value in a while? Start to break up and yeah. get smaller? I mean, so many of them talk about, well, and able to, to be able to compete in the global world, global world, global economy, we obviously need to be bigger and bigger and bigger, but do you think forces are going to come and say, no, go the other way? Yeah. Well, I remember a conversation I had with Larry Summers during the time of the of the Clinton administration when we were dismantling um, the, the, uh, the, the yeah, and and we had a we had a conversation that banks were arguing about uh, how they needed to compete on a worldwide basis and therefore they needed to put together investment banking and bank, same arguments bank still right. And I made the point to Larry at the time, you know, for seventy years this thing has worked well. Why the hell do you want to screw with it now? But they did. The banks won the argument and lost the war. Because it simply, it simply didn't work. You and can't. why doesn't it work? Because there isn't a strategic synergy, it's a financial synergy. The, the idea is that you can take a higher rating for a holding company and apply it to operating businesses that wouldn't generate on their own and provide services at a lower cost than would otherwise be the case. But it doesn't operate that way. The universal bank idea doesn't operate. This country, now your question, this, this, what, the, what we're doing in this country is encouraging banks to get larger and to have fewer banks. Dodd-Frank will reduce the number of financial institutions in the United States. We will make the large institutions bigger. They will, they will then become less flexible, less, less able to be and managed. And still too big to fail. And they will fail. And they will fail. That's the <laughs> mighty scary words you just shared with us, Mr. Yeah, Governor. Not really, because it's got to happen. It, I mean, it's going to happen. It, it will happen. Uh, it is almost inevitable. I hope it's not too many institutions and I hope it's not too expensive, but it's going to happen. I mean, obviously, you're not a big fan of Dodd Frank. I think I picked I that think Dodd Frank's a freaking disaster. I mean, you, you, you take the two guys who were the biggest cause of the housing crisis to begin with and you tell them to write the rules for financial well, institutions. Well, we can have a long argument about whether Barney Frank and Chris Dodd were the biggest causes of the housing well, crisis. We're going to come back to Fannie and Freddie and our whole well, argument. Oh, well, I think Wall Street had a role to play there. Of oh, course a mighty, of mighty course. role, my friend. Of course they had a role to play, but the federal government and its policies of encouraging housing for people who couldn't afford it and providing the money and backing for those mortgages created the environment. Most of subprime refinancings for people who were actually already in their home and the actual low-income borrower, which was led to and led by Fannie and Freddie, actually occurred in the 90s in early 2000s, yeah. Wall Street led that I'll send, I'll send you Peter, Peter Wallace's piece that about 40% of the, of the loans that went to Fannie and Freddie during the, the, re, the, the, real, the real build up was, uh, was the all day loans. Now this, listen, they got into the game again, of course, and, and they totally screwed up as well. Uplifting thoughts today. All right, Harvey Gollum, thank you for being with us. Very yeah, much appreciate Harvey Gollum, our guest. Before we go to break, by the way,